We're recording. So I'm just going to start recording now so people can see what, what a vegan athlete eats. You got Go it. Go ahead, Dave. Start us out on that meal. Avocado, asparagus. Got some avocado, green beans. Oh, green beans. Some textured vegetable protein and red lentil pasta. Looks good. A lot more food than I expected. You're on a program. So uh, let me do the introduction. This is part two of a two-part interview, Dave, probably a multi-part interview, I'm guessing. I didn't get to ask you everything on the last one, so we'll probably have a lightning round this time. Yeah. You can definitely eat while we're doing it so that you don't pass out. We're going to go over your I don't routine. know if I want to talk with my mouth. Uh, we'll see. I'll, I'll, uh, <laughs> what's the I word? Can wait a I can wait a little bit. I had a post-workout protein drink, so I'm good. All right. Um, Dave's a bodybuilder. He's overcome a million things that we're going to get into. We had so much to cover that we, we continued the interview, but mm -hmm. we got into a little bit of how you became a vegan, your parents. I did have one follow-up question from that interview. And, you know, I have notes that we'll probably never get into again, <laughs> just because yeah. I have so much I want to ask you. But uh, if you want to do like 30 seconds intro, just to remind people that come in on part two, who you are, what you're about. And then my first question is going to be a follow-up on what made your father switch like that to 100% vegan, because that helps a lot of people that want to go into this lifestyle and struggle with up and down, up and down. So those are the two things to start. Okay. So my name's Dave. Um, I'm 35, but I get called 25 very often. Um, lately, it's been a lot more than, you know, I'd expect. Um, I have started my fitness journey. I think it was like 2018. I started losing weight. I was up to 220 pounds. Doctors said I somewhere in that ballpark, 220. Um, last, I think I remember was like 215. I hopped on a scale and then I never hopped on one again, but I know that I definitely gained weight after that. Um, doctor told me I was diabetic. I had high blood pressure, high cholesterol, early stages, liver, liver cirrhosis due to the fact that I was, um, an alcoholic that also liked to pop, um, uh, prescription Vicodins, uh, Percocets, all that kind of stuff. Totally did a lot of damage to my body. Um, over the past couple of years, I'd say within four to five, I've reversed all those issues, um, lost at one point, 80 pounds. I was down to 145. Um, and since then I've started hitting in the gym and I've gotten up to about 175. Um, at this point, I continuously am losing waist size, uh, but not losing physical, actual weight. I'm maintaining the same weight while building lean muscle mass all on a vegan diet. Um, I have become a certified uh, NASM personal trainer and also am working with, at this point, a new coach who's also a vegan bodybuilder and am trying to progress myself into the online presence of fitness, health, nutrition, all that stuff. Because um, in my mid thirties now, I wake up every single day and I'm actually in better shape than I was the day previous. And to be honest, not a lot of people can say that. And it makes me feel good. And I know that it can make others feel good as well because I've been there before and I've struggled through basically what everybody else has struggled through, um, obesity, diversity, um, being different than everybody else, uh, being raised a vegetarian um, growing up and now being where I am now, I find myself in a different group of people, a different crowd, um, a lot more happier. Uh, no longer suffering through depression, anxiety, stress. Um, nothing seems to really bother me anymore nowadays. So as long as you're keeping consistent and, you know, just following David Goggins, stay hard, doing all the stuff that you should be doing right. And, you know, that's pretty much me. Um, and as of for your other question, uh, talking about my dad, I haven't talked to him since our last interview. So it's been a little bit, but what I do remember is that he just, it was a story of his, his parents were making like, from what I remember is a stew of some sort. And it was one of those, like throw every type of animal body part into it. Um, 
stomach, bones, everything. And he just had this click in his head. And one day when he was eating it, he like pulled the bone out or something like that. And it was just a part of it. And he's like, I don't want to do this anymore. And he did it for him. He did it for the animals. If I, I mean, more than anything that I remember is it was not about health. Like for me, my transition to vegan was for the health aspect of it. I was unhealthy. I was overweight. I had all these issues and I couldn't figure out why. So I decided to start cutting out the dairy, um, the eggs, the highly processed foods and stuff like that, and just started feeling better. So for him, it was all about the animals. And as a kid, I remember a lot of that is that he, he used to have a bumper sticker that said friends or food or friend or what was it? Meat is animals or friends, not food, something like that. Um, and I was like, always embarrassed. Cause like, dude, dad, you got that bumper sticker on your car. Like people are looking at it, but it's funny. Cause I see bumper stickers like that now. And, and I, and I think I I'm rocking a vegan bodybuilding bo vegan bodybuilder sticker, you know, not on my car, but I have it somewhere around my house, like stuck on something. So, and rocking the vegan bodybuilding t-shirt in public. So things have changed a lot over that. And I think it's a lot with the self-confidence aspect of it. Um, a lot of people don't seem to know who they are and what they want to do with their lives. And you get pressured into believing certain things. And my dad was just like, I don't want to do this anymore. And his parents fought it tooth and nail. Like my grandpa was a very big meat eater. Uh, from what I remember, it was, he lived off of tortillas and meat. Good answer. And while <laughs> we're on that topic, so whether you did it for health or not, did you switch overnight? Uh, you mentioned that you were an alcoholic. There was a lot of health issues. Did you go to the doctor and learn you're dying and just overnight, you're like, I got to get back to my diet or what was? Yeah. So um, the diet aspect of it was, I wasn't sure exactly what to do, but I knew that I had to do something different. So I started just doing research. Uh, well, that was during a doctor's visit that I was in the doctor's office with pains in my pancreas, lower kidney, like pains in my like lower back that I knew it wasn't external because I didn't do any physical activity. So I knew it wasn't from working out. It was something I could feel inside was causing like sharp pains. And so I went to the doctors and they ran a bunch of blood work and all this stuff. And, you know, sitting in the office, doctor's office, they told me that I was you know, high risk type two diabetes. I had high blood pressure, high cholesterol, inflamed pancreas, liver cirrhosis, basically. And I was like, oh, dang, like, what do I do? Um, but part of me always knew, like, I didn't ever want, like, there was a part of me that knew, like, the natural way to do things because I was raised that way, like, from my dad talking about eating food to be healthy and, you know, all this kind of stuff. So I had that, like, somewhat mindset. It was just buried way back down, back there. Uh, so, he had said, the doctor was like, oh, we have all these prescription, you know, go down to the pharmacy and pick it up. And as I'm doing it, I just walk right out the door and say to myself, like, hey, I'm going to figure something else out. Um, so I started, so I started doing some research and figured out ways to reverse diabetes. And obviously being overweight was part of the, one of the biggest problems with it. So um, I saw that riding a bike would be a good way to help you lose weight. And also people that have like high cardiovascular um, stamina also have less risk of diabetes and stuff like that. So I started riding my bike all the time. And to be honest, I'm gonna tell you the first time I rode a bike in not probably like three or four years, I rode about a mile, maybe a mile and a half. And I was, I thought I was dying. Mm -hmm. And then interesting enough is then by like, the, through the progress, I went from like one mile to three miles to five miles to six miles. And I went from one day to two days to three days to, to every day of the week. And I found some friends that were in biking. And by that point, I was also looking at my diet and I started cutting out sugar and I went low carb. But the thing was, is when I went low carb, I was feeling low energy. Mm -hmm. um, so I, decided to, it was kind of around that point where I was biking. So I was built, I was burning a lot of calories and I was eating kind of at a deficit, but then also eating low carbs. So I was starting to feel a little bit of like energy fatigue, but yet I just kept powering through it, pushing through it. 
Um, and then at that point it was like, I was at the end of my biking career and then I went vegan. I had slowly, I kind of started off by just going full days without knowing that I was going full days of vegan. I would just not eat cheese or it just kind of slowly, like I knew I wanted to do it. And then I slowly started cutting it out, like not really knowing that I was doing it, but then my body was telling me that I was feeling better. So then I just kept doing it Mm. Um, because I would go like a full day without any dairy. And then the next day I'd be like, Oh, I'll have a cup of yogurt. And then the next day I'd wake up feeling kind of bloated and I'm like, all right, well, no yogurt, no cheese. So I'd started just full days of vegan. And then we had like a Thanksgiving dinner at my in-laws at the time. And I just stuffed myself so full, um, eating like au gratin potatoes. So cheesy potatoes, all the stuffing, um, no meat of course, but like mashed potatoes with butter on it. Um, and tons of bread rolls. And so I just kind of overdid it. And then that Monday after that Thanksgiving weekend, after just, and then cake and pie and cool whip and all this stuff. Then I woke up Monday and I was like, all right, I'm, I'm going vegan. And ever since then I haven't looked back and I've pretty much never, I I could say I never felt better, but then tomorrow I'll say that I've never felt better again. So what, how long ago was that? Uh, three years ago on whatever day that was after Thanksgiving. I can't even remember. It was like the 29th of November or no, it was the 2nd of December. That's what it was. And you're, so your kids were young. You had, you were married and you had two kids at the time. Yeah. So three years ago, my oldest was like four. And your wife is not vegan or vegetarian. No, no. uh, Go ahead. She, she, she ate meat. Um, she grew up in a household of meat and all this stuff, but she does like vegan food. You know, mm-hmm. uh, one of her favorite, like she said that one of her favorite restaurants of, out of all of her restaurants is called Veganic, um, like an Asian vegan food down in, in Hillcrest. Mm-hmm. So in all her comparisons to all of her favorite food places, there's one vegan up there. <laughs> nice. Hey, they do make good food, especially with the fake meats and all that. Yeah, veganic is really good. Mm. Um, Also, yeah, so she didn't eat a whole lot of meat to begin with. She has like three staple meat items that she just can't seem to get up, give up. But I did a lot of the cooking, so I would make all vegetarian vegan meals. So she would just, she'd eat it. She had no problems eating vegetarian or vegan. It was more like if we would go out to dinner somewhere, she would order a hamburger. Yeah, that's good because there are people that live with families that are not vegan or families. Yeah. That, so the way you did it was just doing it gradually and you had changed, not her. So it was yeah. up to you to be the one to do your thing on your own anyway. Exactly. It was my choice and it wasn't like a pre-engaged type of situation. She knew I was vegetarian and like that was kind of, we had at, at knew that we would at least raise our kids vegetarian um because first off she's like oh i don't really like care for meat that much it's kind of more of a like she has a couple specific things and also that it's just natural it is what she's been raised and how how she was brought up that she doesn't really know otherwise so it's like with what i know from being vegetarian and all this vegan now is that we could raise our kids that way without any any problems. And now that we're split up, um, they are more vegan when they're with me. They're like, just because now my fridge is 90%, 99% vegan items. So when I'm cooking and doing things like that, it's all vegan when we eat at home. It's just every once in a while, when we do go out, if there is something and my kids are like, Oh, can I have, you know, a piece of candy? or whatever that's chocolate. And I'm like, oh, well, I didn't bring anything this time. So I guess so. Yeah, who cares about a label? Like the dogma of something for a lot of people is their downfall. So the fact that there's this wiggle room is actually healthy in many cases. And it's kind of like we, we've we've brought them up to be educated that they do check their labels. The kids are reading them because of not just to mention the vegan or the all the dairy products and stuff that are in there too it's the chemicals the the dyes the 
carcinogens that are in like some of that stuff is just completely terrible and when they ask like oh can i have have these skittles it's like oh man like that's something that we'd have to talk about and read the labels and we educate them on that because even myself they see me doing it everywhere i go too good yeah that when works. you start when you start checking labels as a vegan to see you're just basically checking for eggs dairy you start actually really looking at it you start seeing that there's a lot more stuff that's in there that is a problem yeah. than just the dairy like that's the right. dairy is almost like the least problem in the the foods that are being presented out there as as food <laughs> Yeah. I mean, in the raw vegan community, anything with a label is basically scary, right? you know? Yeah. So I'm with you. It's whole foods is the goal of everything anyway. Yeah. The less ingredients, the better. That's for sure. Do you, um, yeah, I had questions on your food too, but we're not going to have enough time to go over every, everything, but related to your kids, let me just do this last thing. Is there something you wish they knew that you didn't understand when you were growing up vegan? Is there something you wish they knew that you just wish they knew because they're young and they don't understand what experience we have, you know? And you're like, I wish I knew this back when I was their age. So something well, along those lines. I, I think it's important for them to understand that why, you know, you don't eat animals is because there's a sense of compassion with it. And that was something that wasn't really like brought up to me as a kid, like being vegetarian. My dad was like, meat is murder. You know, that, that doesn't really resonate with a kid. It's more like the fact that, I mean, it is, but showing a sense of compassion to all animals that they don't want to eat them because they understand that it's like, oh, that's a, that that has that's a living thing and also that it's it's not necessary to their growth or it's not going to inhibit their growth their protein their their body's type their style of living to not eat those animals and that's where a lot of people are taught and that it, it's brought up that like if you don't eat animals then you're not going to get protein if you don't eat if you don't eat cheese you're not going to get calcium if you don't do this you're not going to get this you know what i mean there's a lot of like kind of scare tactics to it where it's to me to show them that like you can do all these things on a full plant-based diet while being compassionate and showing empathy to these animals because as a kid they they instinctively want to naturally be compassionate to animals. My kids love animals. Like my neighbor has chickens and they pick them up and they, mm -hmm. like they see animals as living things. And I didn't necessarily see it that way when I was a kid, it was more of like, we just don't eat meat. Or right. if you do, you, or if you do eat meat, you're a murderer. And I don't think that that's necessarily a tactic. And, you know, right now it's like, I wish that they would be a hundred percent vegan. Um, but they will eventually, I think, make that decision upon themselves and not be forced to, because to be honest, it's like, it has to be a conscious decision to be made by people that currently eat animal-based products. They have to make that decision on their own. And it's not really our place to force them to make that decision because it's the same. I understand that a little bit differently through a sobriety aspect of it, is like you can't force someone to also quit drinking because it's just not their time yet. You can educate them on why you shouldn't drink or enlighten them on the benefits of not drinking. Like the same as these are the benefits of not eating animal-based products. And this is why it's why you shouldn't eat animal products. And if you believe that you're protein deficient, then you know, I don't, I don't think that's a problem. So it's like, I have more protein than most people that think that they have more protein than I do. It's most people don't even know how much protein they're actually getting. A lot of people are actually under the recommended amount, even for a sedentary type of person. Majority of people though, 
it has been shown in studies that majority of people are actually fiber deficient. And you know why that is? Because they're not eating enough fruits and vegetables. Mm-hmm. But I don't have a protein deficiency issue or a fiber deficiency issue. Right. So that whole aspect of it is just being educated and, you know, kind of teaching my kids that information, I think will be helpful for, for them in the long run, where I don't think it was necessarily um, taught to me as a kid or a lot is, of kids for that matter. Is there something you wish you were taught as a kid that is not related to diet? that you want your kids to understand or don't understand yet? I know that's a hard question, but. Well, I, honestly, I mean, I wish that regular drinking was not so socially acceptable in, in everyday life because I followed that pattern. Like it was, that's, that's something that is not, it's genetic at the same time, the personality of addiction is genetic, I believe, but the culture of social acceptance to drinking was so normalized that like, I wish that it wasn't around. I mean, honestly, going through that struggle, I wouldn't be who I am today if I didn't go through that struggle with alcoholism. But at the same time, it's like, I kind of wish that it wasn't around so normally that I thought like, and I was just a different person. Like other people in my family can have like a beer or two at the end of the night and be fine with it. Or, you know, go to a party and have like one beer. But for some reason for me, it just wasn't normal. I, I couldn't just have one beer. I wanted to have one beer at dinner, but that one beer became six beers like that. So if I wasn't raised around it as much, I don't think I would be. And I'm thankful though that I did go through all that and grateful for it because it was a learning experience. But now knowing that with my ex-wife, she doesn't drink either. And it's not for any particular reason. She just doesn't like drinking. Like that's just her thing. And then me now not drinking as well, will bring our kids up in a, in a sober household. Yeah. Um, did you go, go ahead. I was gonna say, so then, so they won't have to, that won't be normal to them right. in, in the future and potentially save them from their own struggles of dealing with emotional issues by using substances. So we're creating a more sustainable type of productive and like beneficial way of handling real life problems whether it's stress or whatever the case is like depression or any emotion, any type of emotional situation, especially having two daughters, like there's going to be a lot of this and stuff. And I don't want them to think that they have to rely on alcohol to be able to handle those emotions. We're going to have to work to figure out different ways, whether it's going outside and going for a walk and getting physical and uh, physical activity to say, and, handling it just differently. I think it's going to be very beneficial for them in the future. Mm -hmm. That's a good point too. Like everybody has either food for addiction or alcohol or TV, whatever it can be. So, and, uh, and that's true as well too, is, I mean, and they're going to grow up in a household full of health food and, you know, myself watching what I eat, they, my kid, it's funny because they watched me weigh my food and they're like, how much grams is that? Mm -hmm. or how much protein are you having? Look, how many calories are in this? And it's not, it's not unhealthy to do that. It's just, it seems different to other people, but most fit and athletic people really keep an eye on what they're eating. It's obvious that to the ones that don't, and those are the ones that think that it's weird or it's not natural to watch what you eat, but then are shoveling down tons of calories and have no idea how much is being put in and how much is being put out. And that's something that I think is healthy for them to see that. And it's creating a culture inside of our household. Yes. Some, uh, girls, if they were to grow up measuring and obsessing about calories could be unhealthy, but you're yeah. doing it, you're doing it in the context of bodybuilding or fitness competing or anything like that, where 
they already have this natural affinity for plant-based food and it's they have a healthy relationship with food. it's going to be a healthy relationship exactly. with food and then it's also going to like like you're saying with women is yeah they can there can be a development to an unhealthy relationship with food and they want to under eat mm -hmm. but they don't understand the quality of what they're eating and that if i under eat and not actually like putting in, and not putting out work, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I thought your answer was going to be longer. <laughs> yeah, I thought so too. <laughs> That's so funny. Um, okay, I'm actually going to ask uh, two more questions on this topic. Um, and then we could take a break, a five minute break, and you could have some of your pasta. Um, I just want to touch on the divorce really quickly and the alcohol, since you brought those two up. The alcohol, you quit at the same time you became vegan and went to that doctor's appointment. That was your turning point? No, the doctor's appointment was a couple of years before going vegan. I think if it was three years ago, that was 20. It was at the end of 2019, I went vegan. I think my health and fitness journey started at the beginning of 2019. Gotcha. So what made you quit out? No, it was actually 2018 because I still worked at Sprouts at the time. So it was 2018. Some point in there, that's when I had that doctor's visit that made me completely go into high cardio, low calorie, low sugar diet. And then and quit alcohol. Went, no, I actually, so I actually, I was, I was such an alcoholic that I did every healthy thing I could do to not quit drinking. Gotcha. That was the last thing I did. So I was like, oh, if I eat healthy and if I exercise a lot and if I drink a gallon of water a day and I do this and I do this, that I should still be able to drink. So what I made you quit? quit? What made you quit? Uh, there was, it was my, my wife at the time basically gave me an ultimatum at that point. And it was, hey, if you don't quit drinking, I'm going to take the kids and leave basically. So I, I'm grateful and I thank her for that, even yeah. though she may not know it, but she, you know, she made that decision. And a lot of the time that's, that's gotta be what it, that has to be the way sometimes because mm -hmm. otherwise you just keep enabling and enabling and um, stuff like that. Because even I had prior to her making that statement, I had had a, a scare in the emergency room where I woke up in the middle of the night, throwing up blood. Wow. And I panicked and I was like, oh crap, called an Uber, hopped in an Uber and went to the emergency room and the doctors um, put me on a monitor and I was there for a couple hours and they were running some tests and drew some blood and stuff. And the doctor basically said was, you know, he asked me, he's like, how much you, he's like, how much do you drink? And I'm like, oh, not that much, just a little bit here and there, of course, lying my ass off. And he knew instantly, like everybody did, they knew the bullshit. So he's like, well, I recommend that you quit drinking. And I'm like, sure. Okay. So he, they like put some IV and pumped some liquids into me and got me back like rehydrated. And so I was like dehydrated and some, like there was some sort of bleeding in my stomach. They put something in, I guess, that kind of helps line the inside of the stomach, some sort of like coating or I don't know exactly what it was. I was a little bit drunk at the time when this whole thing happened. So yeah, even after that, I was like, all right, well, I'll take a couple of days off from drinking. And that still didn't stop the drinking, but there was a point, like I knew, I knew it was getting bad and I just wasn't ready to quit yet. And so I went on like maybe a couple of days or a couple of weeks. And then I cut back a little bit, drank a little bit less than I was prior to the emergency room. And then eventually I was back to drinking the same, if not more. And I had a really bad drunken night one night and blacked out, caused a big fight with her and da da this and that. And basically she was like, Hey, you need to quit drinking. So I knew that it needed to happen. So when she said that, I think it was kind of like a click in my head that I was like, like, oh crap, this is, this is the time. And then I, that the day after the last day I drank was a month. Was it a Monday? It might've been a Tuesday. I can't remember the exact date, but I called a friend of mine and he, he was sober. He was a family friend of mine. 
and he had been sober for like a year or so at this point and his life was a complete disaster and he turned his life around so I gave him a call and gave him an earful of how everyone's you know I can't believe that she's making me do this and you know it's all them 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 it's not me 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 and he's like sounds like you are kind of he has like you kind of know the answer to what you need to do and I'm like what do you mean and he's like I think you you know like you're at this you're at a rock bottom kind of point and he's like I recommend you go to like an AA and he's like you should you should do it he's like do you want to lose your family and this and that I'm like no I don't like it's not fair but he's like yeah unfortunately kind of like being an alcoholic's not fair not it doesn't happen to everybody and you know, a lot of people ruin their lives. And he's like, my life's much better now. He's like, do you think you can do it? And I'm like, I don't know. So he's like, you should call your uncle because my uncle has been sober for 20 something years, maybe 25 years. And I never really thought of it because he's just always been sober. Like I, it's funny because I told another cousin of mine that and he's like, he doesn't drink. Mm. Like, he's just been around this long and like no one really knew he's a social guy. So, uh, yeah, he's been sober for like 20 plus years. And so I gave him a call and he told me the same thing. And his story was kind of not similar to mine, but he basically said like, the reason I quit was for my family. And he's like the same thing. His wife was going to leave him if he didn't quit drinking. And so he did. And then same thing, his, his wife ended up leaving him regardless, but he was the present father and he grew up to have a, you know, he has an awesome relationship with his, his, his kids and he's a present grandfather and all this stuff. And I was like, all right, like that makes sense. Like that's, that's what I want. So that's kind of when I was like, all right, I guess it's time to quit. So, and I didn't, this was during COVID. So it was in April, 2020. So there wasn't AA meetings to go to. Mm. So I was, I just kind of gritted my teeth and did it. And one of the things I started doing was just started exercising, doing push-ups at home, doing, you know, sit-ups, doing pull-ups, like kind of just doing whatever I could to kind of just keep my mind distracted. And then also listening to a lot of podcasts. There's a, uh, there's a um, radio show on 105.3, and there's a guy on there and he's sober and he's been sober for like 15 years and he had a podcast. Mm. And so I was listening, I listened to that podcast probably like 20 times each episode. I lit, I would fall asleep listening to it just because it was good to hear stories of what other people went through mm. to kind of calm my nerves a little bit to understand like the detoxing and the how bad it sucked going through all that and then at the same time as like people were talking about how bad they don't want to go back to that life they lived and it was like that was kind of like always constantly going through my head that I didn't want to go back to that lifestyle and then it's funny because then I end up doing a, a podcast type of deal with sober community now <laughs> so it's kind of like paying that forward as well do you think that a lot of times they talk about self-love and, you know, if you love yourself, it's easier to do these harder things. And in this case, you maybe weren't there yet, but you did it for the sake of your family. Do you, yeah. did you change how you feel about yourself through this journey or was that a factor? How do you feel about that now? hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, I do now. Uh, I, I believe a lot more in self-care and self-love and taking care of yourself so that you can take care of others. So at the point where I was unhealthy, I wasn't taking care of myself because, and that led to not being the best, taking care of my kids, not taking care of my wife, not taking care of my relationships with friends because I didn't take care of myself. I was poisoning myself with food. I was poisoning myself with alcohol. I was lazy. I was watching Instagram all the time. I was always on my phone. And so now that I'm taking care of myself more, I feel that I'm projecting more self, like it's a lot more selfless when you're drinking, you're selfish and you only think about the next drink or you always 
think about when your day is going to end so that you can have that beer. So you're so soaked up into this self-absorbed type of thing that eventually it takes time for sure. Like the first couple months were miserable and I didn't, you know, you have this lost identity and who you are and, and you think that the, the going out at night and going and doing these things and doing it while you're drinking is who you are. And that, Oh, I'm no fun. If I don't have a drink, Oh, I'm not good at this. If I don't drink, you know, I used to be like, Oh, every time at family events, it's like, Oh, I don't know how to play horseshoes. If I don't have a beer, I get better when I have a beer or like cornhole. Like I have, I'm way better now. <laughs> like I'm so much better at cornhole and horseshoes and all these games than I ever was when I was drinking. It's kind of a sense of identity that we develop over time that's just a habit and that habit's hard to break. But once you do, you start creating all these good health habits. Then you start feeling good. You start feeling good about yourself. Then you start meeting more people that are that same way. And you start projecting that. And like, people want to be around you a little bit more where people like, they didn't want to be around me when I was drunk, you know, cause I didn't want to be around me. Mm. And it is a self love thing. And some people go into that. I did it. Like I didn't do it for myself. Cause like I said, is, I still drank, even though I was exercising and eating healthy and taking care of myself that I still drank, but I did it for my family and my kids. And I think that's a little bit more powerful for me, at least that's kind of stuck it to me because if you do it just for yourself, I mean, you have to do it for yourself, to be honest, like part of it has to be that way if you want to grow, but a lot of people I've seen people relapse because there's not a strong enough connection to, to their why mm -hmm. you have to have a, a very strong why you're not drinking. Mm -hmm. And so in your case, uh, changing your identity and the love for yourself came with just putting in the reps, so to speak. And as your body changed, as your behavior changes, people wanting to be around you more, all of those things around you changed. Mm -hmm. that helped with the self-love. Yeah. And you start attracting other, like other people that are sober and you see what, what people are doing. Yeah. What people are doing outside of the bar. Mm -hmm. There's so much outside there that like you, you like kind of have this untapped potential to what you're doing and you direct that focus that you're normally like, so like blinded by and focused just on the next drink that once you've broken that kind of barrier, there's just like this full potential of things to do with this time that you would have just spent at home on the couch. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah, the, to think about all the time we wasted when we were younger before we realized what we could be doing with our time. There's so much more stuff to be doing that, yeah, and it's, it's such a different, I think about it all the time is like, I do random things where I'll be like, oh, let's go down to the beach or let's go down and get dinner at uh, the village or let's go, like I go down, I do random trips to get ice cream down in um, North Park and just on a whim. And those are kind of things and I take those with my kids. So it's like, we're creating like these memories and like those are things that I wouldn't do because I'd be like, oh, I'm, I'm drunk. Like I can't go do this or I can't go do this. I'm busy, but really I'm just sitting on my couch drinking some beers. Or even if I did, it's like grab an Uber and, and go down to the liquor store or go to the bar down the street. Yeah. Okay. That was really helpful. I appreciate it. I think it helps a lot of people that, you know, it, it, because sometimes people think you can overcome a food addiction or overcome alcoholism or whatever it is overnight and yes you quit overnight but the process of changing your identity and loving yourself more that happens with time yep and, and putting in the work so well you. and that's the thing that there's like a misconception is is that alcoholism doesn't happen overnight it doesn't happen in one day it happens over time mm -hmm. just like self-love or getting sober or getting healthy or getting fit like those things all take time and it's the enjoying the like journey and the process and the progression of it that you have to kind of find yourself in where, where you're not looking towards that end goal. Like having a goal is great, but if you obsess over like 
I need to be sober by this time, or it's been a hundred days. Why am I not feeling sober yet? Your thought process is rushing the actual process and the progression of it, you know, is like, I didn't, there are a lot of red flags in my childhood of drinking and like that I now think of and be like, okay, well, that's a red flag. But over time, it's like my drinking wasn't always bad. It was, it just became an unhealthy relationship with it over a long period of time. It took me 15 years of drinking and poor decision making and up and downs and all these issues that took 15 years of doing that Mm -hmm. to become an alcoholic and to be where I'm at now in just three years of being sober is like tenfold compared to the amount of time it took me to get to that point of alcoholism, if that makes sense, being Mm -hmm. an alcoholic. Yeah. Um, we're definitely, it's so much to talk about, but it's just really helpful information. The last one I'll ask for this part too is, um, on the divorce. I, people may not know, I worked out with you. You were my gym buddy. I knew you through Ramona family naturals. Um, One thing was interesting is that you were sort of able to interact no matter what was going on, but you handle your emotions well, and you don't talk about emotions. Like we talk about emotions. You were going through the divorce during our working out time and you were just like, never missed a beat, even with child custody, even with the divorce. And the flow was like, is he having emotions? Is he able, like, how do you, how do you do it? I'm actually very, I'm actually very emotional. Like I'm a very emotional guy. I get like, I get teared up in movies. Um, Telling my story, like even now kind of gets me teary, um, teary eyed up a little bit, but it's actually, I think I just kind of developed a healthy relationship with my emotions and like, I embrace them as I feel them. So, So like, as I'm feeling like, the sadness of my stories and telling like that kind of stuff is like, I'm embracing it. And it's, it's actually making me happy that I'm able to share it with someone and may change their lives as someone did for me. So I've just kind of built a healthy relationship with them. And a lot of people have these ups and downs and they either binge eat their emotions and you, you bury them down. And for many, many years, like I couldn't talk about things that were bothering me or stressing about things And like, what was wrong? Like my ex would ask me like, what's wrong? I'm like, oh no, I don't want to talk about it and chug a beer or take a shot or whatever. Like you just, and then you just keep completely bury those. And alcohol has a negative effect with your mind. It deteriorates the, the gray matter in your brain, which makes you think differently. And it, it causes mental, you know, illnesses and things like that. So it's like, there's a mental disconnect from your, your heart and your emotions when you're drinking or you're using like distractions from those. I know I've read a lot of books and like Vex King is one of my favorite guys to read books about handling emotions. And, you know, the book, good vibe, good life was great. Um, So I've kind of, you know, read some books about that and read books and David Goggins and like just building mental toughness. And once you've built a like strong mental, I mean, first off, you've got to eliminate the things that distract you from those emotions and you have to embrace them and find healthy ways to work them out. So when I'm at the gym and I have, I'm like having a bad day, like those whole times with you, like I'm super upset about it and I'm super sad, but you're creating natural hormones and like, um, what's that one that creates, um, dopamine, serotonin, dopamines and serotonin. So you're creating happy emotions and hormones Mm -hmm. while you're experiencing these, these levels of sadness. And so you kind of like disassociate them with each other. They kind of become one. So it's kind of like you're, you're happy, to be there. And it's like having the right mindset is that it just wasn't for like us. It just wasn't meant to be like, you know, I'm grateful for the time we had together and thankful that she, I'm more happy that she's happy. You know what I mean? Is because the emotional damage that my 
drinking caused for her that she's able to now be her own person without me like smothering her with the alcoholism and it just put through it's just too much for people to handle and sometimes it's better when you're not apart you don't want to force that kind of stuff and a lot of people will stay together for the kids and then it creates and once again this comes back to the kids is like we we separated and did this thing apart from each other to create a more healthy environment for the kids so like everything that i've done quitting alcohol changing my lifestyle and habit you know creating a healthy relationship with my ex-wife is to create a healthier relationship for my kids so that they don't have to go through the same things that i went through yeah and on emotions you definitely are uh it's interesting like you're good with emotions in terms of like focusing on the gym helps you with emotions because you know you have your next rep and you know what you need to do and you've also shifted to not being the victim anymore yes and that all comes with i mean drinking is one of those ones that makes you completely self it i was so selfish and it makes you selfish and it makes you think me 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 i i i i need this beer because I had a bad day and I need to go out because my wife's nagging me and I need a weekend with the boys to go party. And I, 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 I need this. When you take out the alcohol, you start to not think so much about yourself and you start to think more about others and you become less, you become selfless. And so I think that acceptance and that mindset has helped me kind of be like, all right, I'm able to let you go and do your thing. And we're able to work it out together more as a partnership. And that victim mentality is like, this didn't, and I also, and I think logically about what I did to get to this point. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like, oh, you know, she's a terrible person because she doesn't want to be together anymore. It's like, no, I accept responsibility for the past 10 years. I know that I drank too much and I treated her like crap and she wasn't emotionally supported. And, you know, I did, I did all these things that made this happen. So that self-acceptance has made it a lot easier to move on and Mm -hmm. to be able to have that relationship and healthy co-parenting thing that we have going because I've accepted what I did. I apologized. I'm, I came to peace with it. And it's made it so much easier to move on and just keep going. Mm -hmm. There's no more holding on to that and looking back at like, man, I wish I would have done this different. It's like, no, that's done. All I can do now is control what I'm doing today and hope that it goes in the right direction forward and on to the next day and the next day and just kind of rectify all those wrongdoings that I had made mistakes for. Yeah, the the victim mentality shift, the emotions, the the way you parent, the way you um, love yourself more, like everything just gradually changed to to an amazing level. It does. It's yeah. (laughs) You're you're. I mean, you were a really good inspiration for me. I got in really good shape during our time together, and but the way you handled things was just different than I guess. Could you were you were already there. I was there in terms of like never being a victim, loving myself. Like I was good at all that, but I, the way I watched you handle it, cause to go through something that difficult with you, I, I mean, I see you during it. Um, the way you handle it was impressive and doesn't mean you don't cry. I mean, like you said, the fact that you allow your emotions is another healthy thing that you do and that people need to do. Cause I also believe we're healing our past traumas also when we're allowing our emotions and not resisting and not fearing um, holding on to those traumas stops the progression or at least slows it down so if you can accept it and take responsibility and accept those traumas and what happened Mm -hmm. and you know apologize for them and just be at peace with it they eventually go away and you can move on and heal the other thing to what you were saying is filling your head. The input that you put yourself through during yep. that transition was all positive, was where you wanted to be, whether it was Goggins or someone that had sobriety 
or someone that was fit, you made sure, even if you weren't thinking it yet, to align with what you intended to manifest. Yeah, you put you put into your mind what you want to put out into the world. So if you're putting in the Kardashians and all their life is drama and- Oh no, you, I'm gonna get canceled now that you said that. Yeah, oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> and, and, but you put in stuff, I mean, even, I mean, majority of reality TV shows, to be honest, it's just, they're constantly arguing and fighting and bashing their exes and having these dramatic problems that then turn into their lives and it, and it happens and people wonder why that happens to them. And then they play the victim because that's what they see on TV. But if you put yourself in a place where you're putting in to where people are actually going through real life experiences and they're actually coming out positively and they're going through the same things that you are, then it makes it a lot easier to go through that. Like, I, I don't think I would have been able to make it through, you know, having a, a, a strong mindset if I didn't listen to David Goggins can't hurt me like five times or read his books or, you know, actually do the work that he was doing and getting out there and running and doing all this stuff. Because you know what? He went through it. He went through the, the overweight. He went through drinking problems. He went through divorce problems and he handled it and he came out on top. And there are a lot of people out there that are doing it, but they're not well known as some of these other people that are not doing positive things. And that was, that's the kind of stuff and the message that needs to be put out there to be able to share what, because majority of people are going through that not what other people on reality TV are going through. Nobody has, you know, ridiculous money problems and their, you know, Land Rover broke down and they had a, you know, then they had to call a tow truck guy and were crying in the middle of Beverly Hills. Like that's not what majority of people are going through. Majority of people are going through what myself are going through, that you went through, that these traumas that are being handled properly. Really good. That's a good place to end it for this part. So we could take a five minute break. We'll come back and uh, I'll start the recording again. We'll do part three. It won't be as long. I think we just have six quick questions. They're not gonna be quick. We know that, but yeah, <laughs> you talked about your broken legs on the last part briefly. I just want yeah. you to tell people what happened, how it affected you, how it affects your bodybuilding, what lessons you know all of that thing because that's a journey as well sorry about the heater let's turn that off okay so broken legs um your, the injuries that happened to you and and how that journey went yeah so the uh broken legs i broke both femurs tib fib uh, shattered my foot uh, my right foot basically is like 20 pins uh like in wire all held together so i don't i don't have a lot of flexion um in my right foot um, got lots of scar tissue overall. I think there's like four titanium rods and some 20 something pins and screws. So that was from a dirt bike accident. I grew up racing dirt bikes and riding dirt bikes. And, um, at the time it happened was in my early 20s. So it'd be 10 years ago. So I was 25. So was 10 years ago this year. And I was not in the best shape, uh, bought a dirt bike, thought I could still compete and ride. I mean, I was still pretty good at it. Stand by. Good thing we're not live. Good thing I I'm not. I, I might post this. You don't know. I had a, I had a tickle in my nose and then it just all of a sudden started sneezing. So, uh, yeah, I was into dirt bike racing and in my like late teen years, early twenties, took some time off, bought a dirt, then my mid twenties, bought a dirt bike, started racing again and riding all the time. And so that happened, but I wasn't, I had this mentality that I was like still in shape and I'm like, Oh, I'm in my early twenties, but you know, I was still smoking cigarettes. So that, and then like the night before I had a couple beers and I am pretty sure I was, I had a beer in the pits while I was waiting in between motos and smoking cigarettes in between. So I wasn't in the best shape, a little bit overweight, but uh, yeah, I got in a dirt bike accident there, got flown out of, um, it was at Paula Casino. There's a dirt bike track out there and, and went, they flew into Escondido, 
had to get surgery right away. And then a week later had to get surgery on my foot. Spent like two weeks in that hospital and then got trans, um, transitioned into another one that was a little bit closer to home, like more of like a kind of hospice care type one. And I was there for probably another two weeks. So I think I was in the hospital for four weeks um, through surgeries. And, you know, that was a very, it's very interesting. Now I think about it a little bit more now is that it was a very, it was like a transition of identity. I was very, I thought like, oh, now what am I going to do with my life? Like, I'll never be able to ride dirt bikes ever again. Like victim mentality, not really thinking about why it happened. Um, more of just like, woe is me. And that kind of started a kick to like depression. Cause like I grew up racing dirt bikes. I loved it. It was a huge passion of mine. And at that point I kind of like thought, oh shoot, like this is over. <clears throat> like I won't be able to ride dirt bikes again. And then going through that while being depressed and, you know, going through all these surgeries, physical pain, emotional pain, um, the fear of like not knowing what was going to happen going forward. Um, I was also on like a ton of uh, pain medication and, you know, that I had early stages of like alcoholism and like I, I had this mentality of numbing the way I felt. So going in through all these surgeries, going through like Oxycontin, um, Dilaudid, all these like straight IV prescription drugs. And then not to mention like that was kind of a point where I started getting into pain medicine and medications. And I was after the hospital and I got home, I was in a wheelchair and I was always in pain. And like I said, suffering from like depression, I was always popping. I had Oxycontin, uh, Vicodins, Valiums, Percocets. And that went on for like six months, um, going through that. And I like be truly believed that like I needed those things to feel better. Um, about the pain that I was going through. And that kind of led to like more drinking, obviously. Um, the, the pills and drinking kind of went hand in hand. And then even after, you know, all my prescriptions were, you know, done, um, I still somehow always found a way to find prescription drugs. Like I always knew somebody that had one or uh, a friend knew a friend that could get it to me. So like I was always up and down, um, with the prescription drugs over the years. And then, um, it got to a point, like I started gaining, like I gained a lot of weight, um, while I was in a wheelchair, obviously I wasn't exercising or doing anything, just ordering to go food and to my house and stuff like that. So I did gain some weight. And then, so like my upper body was heavier. So I was carrying around more weight, which caused pain on my legs. They were weaker. Um, so that took a long time and it took years um, of excuses and prescription drugs to then get to the point of being sober and actually exercising that I realized like that the pain wasn't because of all this stuff. It was because I was overweight and I wasn't exercising. I wasn't working out my legs and it's been, it stopped me from running for a long time. Like I didn't want to run. I didn't want to walk. I didn't want to hike. I didn't want to do all these things because there was this pain, you know, or issues because of my legs but once I started getting physically active, this is just kind of another hurdle of things that was like kind of stopping me from doing what I, to, to getting physically healthy and active. And once I started slowly introducing the biking, the, the hiking, the running, it's now become a lot easier. And now I challenge myself and push myself um, in doing certain leg exercises or, you know, running. I'm on, I think, 175 days in a row. I think at least a mile got like 200 and probably 40 miles ran this year. So like I had always had excuses that, Oh, my legs won't be able to do it because of all the surgeries and because of this and, and that, but it was all, you know, up here, it was all mental. A lot of it was just excuses. And until I started like pushing myself outside of that comfort zone and losing a bunch of weight, did I realize that like my legs are, they're still bad, but they're, they're not that bad. And I'd say a lot of the problem with 
the issues I have around my, my, the physical strength of my leg is just a lack of work, not the excuse of because they were broken and because this and that. Earlier, you mentioned the word hospice during your rehab. You didn't, you didn't mean like hospice or maybe I heard you wrong. Cause that's like when you're dying or something. Yeah, no, it was, um, sorry, I did say hospice, but it was a, um, like a rehab. Yeah. It was like a caretaker type of situation, like, a a hospital care where like there was a nurse by my bed that would, cause I couldn't get out of bed. Hmm. So like, I'd have to ring a bell and someone would have to come and help me up to go to the bathroom or they would come by and I would, you know, get in a walker and they would walk me around. Or actually at that point, I wasn't even able to be in a walker. It was a wheelchair. They would help me from, from my bed to my wheelchair. And then from the wheelchair, you know, take me outside and I'd go outside for a couple minutes and then come back and then get back in bed and then get hooked back up to an IV and get more pain medication. Did you overcome your, pill addiction at the same time as your alcohol? Yeah, I just be like, it was all just straight sobriety all at the same time. Because yeah. at, at a certain point is like, I, I had realized that I had stopped taking the pills for the pain. It was more at that point, it was kind of a numbing. I mean, I was numbing the pain of everything, not just the physical pain of the, the hurt from my legs. And most people do that under doctor's care or in rehab or like alcohol or pill rehab. You just did it on your own while raising a family while working. Yeah. Any yeah. Uh, tips for, <laughs> for anyone? I mean, to be honest, like it, it's not the safest way to go. Yeah. Um, but for me, I just believed so strongly in the, I mean, that, that's just my mindset. And that's something that if I'm doing something, I'm all in to whatever it is that I'm doing. I may have times where I'm like a little bit of here, a little bit of there doing this and doing that. But when my focus is on something, it's, it's all directly into that. And like I said, is like the, the fear of losing my family was what just made me make that decision to go through. Um, and I did have like a support group of people that I knew that were sober And that kind of came with time. It's like, I ended up starting my support group got bigger and bigger as I grew, but a lot of people do need that because it's such a dependency. We become so dependent upon the substances that they need other people to help them as like a codependency, like a co group effort to get sober. Yeah, it's um, and it can be a chemical dependency, and you got to do it gradually. Yeah, it's it can definitely a lot of people. It it can be scary, and I didn't realize it till afterwards. Is that like detoxing from alcohol and stuff can be fatal? Yeah, all of it Mm -hmm. and the pills. So amazing, but but the tools you used uh, in terms of filling your mind with healthy things and doing it gradually and yeah. shifting what you focused on. And, you know, those steps worked for both things, including the way you were eating and, and mentally feeling and all of those things. It's a, it was like a full body detox yeah. from head to toe of getting everything out that was negative in my body. And even still like to this day, I find things that are somewhat negative, but I'm more aware of them. So it's a lot easier to kind of just kick them to the curb and get rid of that negative thing as my body is feels it to be negative and rejected it just is so much easier to just slowly start batting those things away where it doesn't seem as like over over consuming of of yourself yeah you know how to switch it now yeah on uh, your group coaching i just had one question on public speaking have you ever done that before does it make you nervous if it does you know how do you overcome that or what what's your feeling on that Um, I have not, um, I have confidence, I guess, and that I, I, I think that I'm capable of it, but I don't know what to really expect. I have an idea. Um, but I've realized that like things don't always go as the way you expect them to go. So worrying about, or being fearful of something that hasn't happened yet is like paying for something that you haven't gotten yet. It doesn't really make sense for me to do that anymore. So I'm just kind of 
prepping myself and taking the steps and taking advice from people that have gone through it and have done it, just like with everything else I've done and overcome is following the leadership of someone else that's already been through it. And then just taking their advice and being prepared. I think that I have a higher expectation because like my expectation for my own personal workouts is at a certain level and I've surrounded myself with people that have high expectations of workouts, but understanding that I didn't get to this point overnight. So like people having that understanding of someone that's just starting off, I would say my knowledge is a lot more than them or a lot more than others that have no knowledge of in the fitness realm and coaching or anything like that. Um, and I, did coach, you know, groups at Sprouts and management and teams. And like, I've done a lot of things like that where public speaking doesn't really bother me. And I've done things on Instagram and talking live and all that stuff that has kind of helped with the experience of talking in front of people. But I have the mental like mindset of someone that has leadership and I have experience in that where I feel like that'll translate. And I think my knowledge in the fitness realm has grown a lot and I'm passionate about it. So I think that people resonate towards people that are compassionate and on it or passionate and honest and just like being themselves and open. And I think that's kind of what attracts people instead of always being the person that directly has the answer. Cause if I don't like, I, I don't know the answer, I'll, I'll figure it out and I'll come back to it and I'll let you know. Like, I don't have that mindset that I have to know everything and that it has to be perfect because that's kind of where it kind of falls apart a little bit. And I think that makes people nervous, um, which, yeah, I am a little bit nervous. <laughs> you'll do, <laughs> you'll do great, of course, but, Not gonna but lie. yeah, yeah. No, the little bit of nervousness is actually healthy for a good, good showing. It means you care is what they say. Yeah. And they also say to focus on the physical sensations because it's the same as excitement the anxiety is the same as excitement or nervousness is. So um, then you're fine. But did you ever have anxiety about anything in the past before you became good at public speaking? And how did you overcome anxiety? I used you... to have a lot of anxiety over it, things. And you had alcohol I'll... to deal with it. So yeah, when... I used alcohol to deal with it. Right. And, it w and it just made it worse to do with like personal insecurities and just not knowing who I was. So it's like, I think the anxiety has kind of gone away um, in that way because I'm more comfortable with who I am. And I've just self-acceptance, like just accepting who you are, what you do, what you believe in and being passionate about what you believe in makes it a lot easier when you sometimes have anxiety over something, it's because you don't really care about it. And so like there would be certain things that I'd be talking about that I don't really believe in. Um, and even businesses where I feel anxious about talking about their brand or whatever the case is when I didn't really care about it, it comes more naturally when you really believe in what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So I think that helps a lot with overcoming anxiety, but working out like helps with that, you know, when you push yourself to do one more rep or you push yourself to increase the weight, um, when you push yourself to run that extra mile, like a lot of things don't really seem fearful anymore. Like, I don't know the first time I broke 10 miles on my run, which for me, that's huge. Like I know people run that stuff like all the time, but 10 miles is a long time. Like that's, that's huge. It was like, it was like two hours. Like imagine, think about that. Like your body is moving at a, a decent pace for two hours straight. Like that's yeah. a long time and overcoming that was huge. There was like points. You also have to have like that self talk with yourself. Like there, there's points where like long distance running has really put a perspective on where you you're alone with your thoughts and the things that you tell, talk, tell yourself and talk about can be either positive or negative. And if, as soon as you start thinking negative thoughts, like, oh shoot, I don't know if I can do this. Your body instantly starts reacting to that. And you start thinking like, oh crap, can I really do this? And then you start to feel like cramps or tired. And so like the first time I ran 10 miles, there was like a part where I was like, 
I don't think I can do this. Like I, like you start having like a panic attack, but you're way out there. You're, you're nowhere near your house. You're nowhere near your car. You don't have an option to stop. I mean, you could stop and walk the rest of the way, but you still have to complete the task and whether you do it walking or you do it at a comfortable pace where your heart rate's controlled, it's like, you have to learn to, you have to like teach your mind how to control your heart rate. So when you're feeling anxious, it's usually your heart rate starting to pick up because of what your mind is thinking. So if you can control what your mind is thinking, you can kind of help reduce your heart rate a little bit and help ease some of that, that anxiety. How do you do that though? Like I, I, Goggins talks about running without music and without anything just to torture himself and make him do it. And I'm like, when I'm running or when that's I'm really, that's really tough. I have to have music on. Uh, yeah. Sometimes I, I switch on to a podcast and listen to other people talking about running because they talk mm -hmm. about the same kind of stuff you're going through, but then you just kind of remembering it's like one step at a time. If you, you can keep going as long as you just take one more step, one more step, mm. one more step. So it's like, if you're nervous about public speaking, it's like, just say one more word or, you know, talk about one more topic or, you know, engage with the people. Like there's just, but it all comes down to like a certain level of like confidence. And I think that's like where I'm at now where I don't really worry about that. I don't worry about, I don't, I try not to worry about things that haven't happened anymore, if that makes sense. I used to be so fearful of like what was going to happen the next day. Like, especially with work, like that stressed me out like crazy. It's like, what am I going to walk into tomorrow? Like, am I, are we going to be at the sales that we need to be? How's the store going to look? Like, am I, is someone going to call out sick? Like those kind of things are just like out of my control, but being in like a leadership type of role and a manager is like, you feel like you have to control those because it's your responsibility. But really when it comes down to, it, it's kind of like, you're only responsible at the end of the day for like what you can control, whether it's taking one more step at a time or pushing one more rep. It's a very, I've kind of realized that it's, it's me versus me. And either I'm going to be the person to stress myself out, or I'm going to be the person to cause anxiety or I'm going to be the person to talk myself up and, you know, think good thoughts about myself and recognizing those thoughts. Cause a lot of self-talk is super important to how we perform mm -hmm. our body. Our, our mind doesn't know the difference. So a lot of people will talk about themselves and say negative things. And when you say it out loud and you think it, your body doesn't know that you're joking or kidding, even if it's just for one second. And you talked about getting yourself to 10 miles and that relates to one of the questions, which is you're going to do a half marathon. Yes. What, what is that the one in San Francisco? Yeah. So yeah. that relates to your alcoholism too. You're bringing everything full circle. What, when 100%. is that? What, That's what uh, that? next, like almost a month from now. Okay. Almost so, a month from now. So, I mean, I, I, like I said, that, that makes me kind of, anxious and a little bit nervous um to think about that because that's even that's a long time and i've done 10 miles and i'm like that's hard so to do another like 3.2 or three and a half after that is is a lot more um but like i said i mean i'm just gonna not stop and even if i do then like then i just walk it my goal is to not walk that's even if it's, even if I'm jogging at like, like a, like a two or a three, like I'm still going to jog it. I'm not, I don't want to walk. Um, and then I've kind of gotten an idea of what I need to be prepared for it because I've kind of figured out what, like when my body starts needing things around like mile seven, my body, I start needing electrolytes. So I'm starting to feel dehydrated by that point. So if I have something to rehydrate me, maybe some beet powder, coconut water, um, some amino acids, some electrolytes, some salt tablets. And if I prep it right, then I can take it before then. And then I won't get some cramping. And then, um, at this point, I mean, I wanted to have 13 miles under my belt prior to it. So, I mean, there's a possibility I, I can do that. I've realized that 
my body is healing a lot faster. Uh, last year when I ran an eight mile run, I was out of commission for like two or three days. Like I was so sore, but the most I had ran up to that point was five miles. Mm. And I ran leading up to that point. My goal I was to do like 30 days in a row. I did 30 days in a row. I did like 33 training for that marathon or that eight mile run. But I've done two eight miles so far and then two 10 mile runs. And so I think I'm fine for that aspect. It's just the thought of doing another three on top of that is kind of like miserable. And then there's things like, I don't know, like if my phone dies, then I will be running without headphones. But also I, 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 I'm doing it. I want to do it in San Francisco because it's also going to be very scenic. So that is very distracting from all the negative thoughts and the, 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 the parts where you're thinking your body's breaking down, then you can just kind of look at the scenery and enjoy it. And, you know, the, the, the reason behind wanting to do it is still motivating. Um, and I think by that point, like I'll probably have close to around like 300 miles ran. So I, between that and then a little bit of stretching, that's something I need to work on too is prior to that, some, some good stretching and yeah. What is the reason? So the reason for it is, I mean, I, I like San Francisco. We lived up there for like three years, but a lot of my, my drinking became really bad at that point. And I was very inactive. Um, it was kind of a bummer because we lived in such a nice area that I didn't appreciate it as much as I should have, like, it was more of like going to restaurants and bars and, um, things like that. It wasn't enjoying the like outdoor aspect of it. I mean, we went to the beach all the time. We lived near the beach and we would go down there with the kids, but it'd be like, I'd pick up a beer before and, you know, hang out and drink a couple beers while at the beach and, um, didn't do any physical activity. I just wasn't physically active. And I kind of regret that a little bit. Um, that I wasn't, I didn't appreciate, like, I feel like now if I lived there, like I would be, I would probably be more active there now than I am active here now. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So it'll be really cool for that. And I never walked across the golden gate bridge. So I get an opportunity to run across it, which would be really cool. Um, and like, I'm also afraid of heights. So like, that's kind of heights scare me a little bit. So I think it'll be kind of a combination of overcoming that and, Um, you know, proving to myself, you know, what, what could have been, not what could have been, but but like what has become because of everything that has conspired and happened together. Yeah. That's going to be amazing. So you have a month more to train. Yeah, it'll be fine. I'm not worried about it because it it hasn't happened yet. I'm not going to let the worry of something 30 days from now, like stress me out. I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing and progress each day and yeah. I mean, the goal is just to have a nice, steady, consistent heart rate where I'm not over pushing myself. I'm not trying to race anybody. I'm just trying to, it's me versus me. So I'm the only person that needs to beat, beat me. Yeah. And a lot of the things that you're concerned about are fixable, preventable. You can walk. If you have to, you can get a backup charger for your phone. You can yep. bring your coconut powder. So you're, you're going to be good. I'm excited for that. And related to that is your men's physique. I heard you mention you're going to do a competition or no? I haven't gotten one yet that I'm interested in, but we are now working on prepping for that. I went to, I went, oh, I didn't tell you. I went to that muscle contest down in San Diego, down at the Harbor. Okay. And um, it was cool. Yeah. It's so fun. <laughs> it, was, it was very interesting. There was a lot of dudes that were pretty big. There's a lot of women that were pretty big as well, but <laughs> yeah. I saw, I just kind of wanted to gauge to see where I'm at. And like some of the people on stage, I'm not that far off from. So like, it's not a couple tweaks here and there. Um, and I should be pretty ready in a couple months. Um, not, I mean, maybe I don't, honestly, I don't know, but I'm just going to do what, my coach John is working with me on and follow his instruction because he's actually in prep right now for a men's bodybuilding contest. And he's going for 
think he's going for like classic. He's 250 pounds. Hmm. He's, he's a big dude. And he, and his goal is to be the first like classic men's vegan bodybuilder. I don't think there's a lot of men that are in that class. I think that's the class he's looking for. I'm not hundred percent sure, but as for men's physique, mine would be like novice. Um, they also have like a first time novice class, but yeah, I don't, I don't think I'm that far away. So it's just a couple fine tunings and stuff and taking some knowledge from someone who's actually done it. Yeah. I'm trying to look up classic men's physique is the middle between the guys who want to take their muscularity and size beyond the limits of men's physique, but not quite to the extremes of bodybuilding. Oh, he might be going for bodybuilding. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know what the weight class is on that, but he might be going for that. Well, even if you were to get on stage and not place where you wanted, it would be an amazing accomplishment to even get to that. That's incredible. So. Yeah, and even just to do it, because I mean, to be honest, like there, there was some people that it's just a, it shows their their confidence, and there was actually a, a family friend of mine, like family family friend, like I've met him a couple times. He was there, and he was competing um, for the first time in the men's physique, like novice class, and he went through some similar stuff as a kid. He was like two like two hundred forty pounds. He was extremely overweight and heavy, and he's mm-hmm. lost a bunch of weight and he's pretty lean now, but he's like the same size as me. And I'm like, Oh, okay. Like we kind of went through similar stuff, like same height, same, same, almost the same body weight, same, similar physique. I'm like, well, you know, I guess I probably could have been up on stage, but I just want to see what it was like. Um, check out the atmosphere. It was super cool. And I'll go with you to the next one. And there's also the fit expo. They're not going to do that this year, but they will be next year in San Diego. Oh, they're not. I thought, yeah, I thought San Diego was on the schedule. It was normally planned to be at the end of the year or something. Yeah. I don't know why they changed it, but that's, that's, it's just fun to see people doing what you plan to do. You, you seem to uh, continually add things to your plate, big goals to keep you moving. Is that one of your techniques, one of your tools or? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think that was one thing that I never, I never had. And people, like it was interesting in job interviews and stuff like at Sprouts was like, what's your goals for five years? And it's like, I, I, I don't know, like make something up, you know, never really thought of it. But it's like now, like I can tell you like I what what some of my goals are and they're all personal goals um, and they're all relative to like what kind of industry I want to be in and, and what kind of work I want to do. And it's like, just keep checking them off. I think that if you don't have a goal, then it's you, you kind of just float around and you don't really know where you're going. You don't have like a disciplined regimen of how to get there. You're not learning new things. So like getting into a men's physique was like, I have to learn how to get to that. So I'm like educating myself more and more and challenging myself. And same with like running the half marathon. Like, I don't know how to run a half marathon, but I'm going to just keep running until I figure out how to do it. And, you know, it's like, this is, this year is half marathon. Next year, I want to do marathon. The year after that, I want to do 50 miles. And then the year after that. So by like the time, by my year of being 40, I want to try to do a hundred, an ultra marathon. Wow. I don't know if it's going to happen, but at least like, that's the, that's kind of what my goals are. They may change. Mm Mm-hmm but at least like for five years, I like have an idea of what my physical goals are. Is there something big that's not physical that you want to achieve in this lifetime? Like something grander spirituality wise, physical, emotional? I don't think so. Not really. I mean, honestly, like I just want to continue to share and help others like that. That to me makes more sense because like I see the way that the world's going and the way that the health and lifestyles of people are going. And I would like to just keep pushing forward in my own physical aspect of it and continuously like share that and show people what's possible if you can do it. So that the more goals I hit, the more it shows what's possible through a healthier, fitter, sober 
you know, greater mindset type of life. Yeah, I think you're doing that being of service. And yeah, uh, and that, that's kind of what my goal is, is just to be more of service to others so that they don't have to struggle for long periods of time. You know, it, I struggled for 10 years, not even knowing it and or 15 more, whatever the years were that I struggled for. So it's like if someone if there was more inspiring people out there to share their stories and I would have heard that sooner, mm -hmm. then I could have changed my life sooner. Maybe I could have salvaged my marriage, you know? Mm -hmm. So the more people are there out like there, like I want to be in the same realm as like the rich rolls and the David Goggins and Nimai and the, um, even, you know, John, the bodybuilding vegan, like these guys that are just, you know, doing great things and showing the world what's possible and using that platform. And that's like, and that's their careers. That's what they're doing. Like that's, my kind of goal is to be along the same lines as that. Yeah. You made me think too, that someone might just see you on Instagram for the fitness or because they know you through someone else, but then you end up helping them because they find out you overcame alcoholism and they right. might be drinking or, you know, well, and that's just the same thing. I had a meeting with someone today because my cousin talked to him about Perium and then he shared his story and then he shared my story with him. And then I had a conversation with him. Mm -hmm. And so it's all kind of relative to what people are going through. So the more you kind of have had to struggle through, the more you have to share and the more people you can help. And if you don't, you're in surrounded in that community, you know, people that have gone through something similar that you can help them. Yeah. And it's not easy to put yourself out there. That's why I prefer written interviews to, to being out there. So it's nice that you're willing to do that and help others. You definitely have touched a lot of people already. So, yeah. And I do need to work on it more. I should probably do more lives personally, like myself, mm -hmm. but sometimes I just like, I don't, I don't know what to really say or think about, but sometimes that's what works. Yeah. And just practicing and doing it more. That yeah, kind of thing. exactly. Okay, last, last question is just, um, if there's something that you wanted to talk about that I didn't ask you, I want you to be able to share that message or uh, just advice for people that need to overcome an addiction or that feel a little bit hopeless or that have tried many times and failed, you know, all sort of related and uh, what you think you can help them with by, you know, your advice. Well, for advice, if you are going through some stuff is just keep consistent. The more consistency you have in adding positive things into your life, the more you'll just keep adding more and more positive stuff. And it, sometimes it's like, it'll seem impossible. Like if I were to go back five years ago and all the stuff I'm doing now, if I were to say to myself that I could have done that five years ago, I would have said you're crazy, but there's just one, you just one little piece at a time and write it down. Um, think positive, talk to yourself positive check it off like a checklist and then surround yourself around people that are doing what you want to do and surround yourself with people that have gone through the same thing. Like I, I reached out and I did a lot of research on people that were struggling with alcoholism or struggling with weight loss. And those are the kind of people that I gravitated towards and listening to their stories and be open-minded too. Cause if you have a closed mind, to what it is, what you think may be the change because you will, you may think that if I quit drinking or if I quit eating meat, that this is going to happen, but it's not a matter of like subtracting things out of your life. It's a matter of removing that and adding stuff to it. You may take little chunks away, but you'll add so much more to your life. And it'll be more satisfying than just the one thing that you're attached to. A lot of people worry about like quitting alcohol you're, or giving it up. You're not giving it up alcohol. You're gaining a better relationship with people. You're gaining a healthier lifestyle. You're gaining more money. Well, I didn't even talk about money. The amount of money I've saved from not drinking, like that isn't even a consideration at this point because that doesn't really matter. It's just one of the things that are going on, the, the healthier thoughts you'll have, the um, less hangovers you'll have. So 
if you sit down and really look at it and be like, write it down, what I'm giving up, alcohol. And then you do another column and you say, what I'm getting from quitting or what I'm gaining. And you start thinking about the things that you'll gain in your life. It'll easily outweigh what you're taking away from it. So we're not really losing. It's addition by subtraction. You subtract a couple little things, you add it. And look into habits. Habits are huge. Most of the time we drink and we do all these things, overeating, um, driving through drive throughs A lot of it's just because it's a habit. It's a convenient habit that we keep doing. And once you look at what your habits are and you replace them with newer habits, that was a big one too. I read The Power of Habit. That was like one of the first books I read when I was Duhigg? like going sober. What? Is that by Charles Duhigg? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's a good one. I mean, I would recommend that and recommend books, look at self-help books, look at self-love books, look at habit books, look at motivation books. Um, there's so many good books out there. I've read mm-hmm. so like, that was one thing I, I read books now all the time. I, before going sober, I haven't read a book in probably like 15 years, 10 years. Mm-hmm. That's a big but, one. Yeah. It, it, it's very important because it's also your you're stimulating your mind where alcohol and bad foods and stuff like that, it numbs your mind. It kills brain cells. You need to start stimulating those brain cells, realize that your gut, your, your gut and your mind are connected. So you start working on one or the other, the other is going to start following the leader on that and start healing. So pick one. And then at one, at some point, both of them will start healing and you'll have the full connection mind heart gut what about people that try to do what you do but fall down and then they're like well i just screwed up anyway i might as well just drink for the rest of the day or i might as well eat crap for the rest of the day this is hard whatever and so they have a sort of a yo-yo thing what do you tell people that struggle in that way is you kind of have to find you have you have to find some help Find somebody that resonates with you. That was one of the things why I didn't really go to AA or any of those meetings because sometimes they can be off-putting. So for me, if I'm a 35-year-old who's struggling with alcoholism and I keep having these ups and downs, it doesn't make sense to me to go to an AA meeting that has a bunch of like 50 and 60-year-olds that are you know, still smoking cigarettes and drinking coffee and they're in a circle and they're like complaining about why they're sober and how it sucks and this and that. And there are groups like that. And sometimes people gravitate towards that and they have their own group of people that are sober, but they haven't changed their mindset. So you need to find someone to gravitate to that is similar to you. And with social media and all these, I mean, internet, all everything, you have a full resource of people that can be relatable to you. Don't try to be sober for somebody else. Be sober for yourself and find someone that's like you and you won't have as many ups and downs. And find, like that's like with me and my buddy, like he was my same age. He went through a lot of the same stuff. I reached out to him. My uncle, my uncle, he went through the same thing with his ex-wife and he went through, he, his reason for being sober was for his kids. And that was my same reason. So I reached out to someone that was the same age as me that went through the same stuff. I reached out to someone who was, who had the same reasoning I did to go sober. And then I started connecting with other people that were in the same social group as me that were vegan and sober. And so we talked about health food and sobriety. And so find people that make sense to what you're going through. Yeah. It, and the accountability you talked about the mentors, examples of people have done what you've done, know your why, um, the input, the consistency, the input, the reading it snowballs. It, yep. It's everything. It's not one thing. And it's not going to be overnight. Like you said, it doesn't take you overnight to get to that point. It doesn't always get fixed overnight. And yeah. that's part of the healing journey, which is actually normal. They don't have to internalize it as like, I failed. It's not a failure. It's just part of the journey where it's not exactly perfect. And if you think of failing as being a failure, 
you have to change that mindset on that because if we were to not fail at things, we wouldn't learn. You learn so much quicker from failing than you do from succeeding in it. And that's what keeps people stagnant or, you know, level at the same. Um, once you've started failing, if we did it fall when learning to walk, we probably wouldn't learn to walk. So if you didn't fall and you were always picked up and put on somebody's lap or put in a stroller, you would take longer to learn how to walk. Mm -hmm. So that mentality needs to be transitioned to everything that we do. And if, I mean, in the physical fitness world, working out to failure is the best for muscle growth. Right. So if you think of it just like that, like if you're pushing the same amount of reps and doing the same amount every time and you don't, you don't put your body to fail, then your body's not going to grow just like you won't grow or you won't succeed if you don't fail a couple of times. And I mean, there's a lot of people that have relapses and stuff like that and it happens, but doesn't mean you need to completely go the opposite direction back. You fail, you get back to it. And then you just keep going one day at a time. Exactly. One day at a time, one step at a time, one rep at a time. Yeah. I mean, I want to go work out now after talking to you. (laughs) So I'm good. What if uh, people want to reach you with questions or accountability or any of that stuff? What what is the best? Uh, Social media, Instagram or Facebook, uh, Dave Luna underscore, or it's Dave underscore Luna underscore one, two, six at Instagram. And then Facebook is David Luna. I, I think there's that. a couple, da- there's a couple David Luna's out there, I think, but, um, I don't think all of them are flexing in their profile picture. So <laughs> not like you are, that's the um, one I'm going to stop the recording, but I'll put the information as far as uh, what they, how they can contact you as well. I'll put that down. Um, so this is good for the interview part. I appreciate you. I'm going to stop the Thank recording you. on this.